A compact wide field of view telescope is an excellent starting point for astrophotography, as well as just veteran astrophotographers as well. It just takes demand off of your equipment, your guiding and your polar alignment. To that end, I've been using the Sharpstar 61 EDPH2, which is a wide, small, compact, that's redundant, refracting telescope, which has been loaned to me from First Light Optics. And in this video, I'm gonna share my thoughts and feelings about this telescope. 335. 335mm f5.5 is the native specs of this telescope. But you can put an optional reducer on this to put it down then to 275mm f4.5. Put that into perspective, if you use a 1.5 crop sensor camera like the O71MC Pro, you could get the entire Flaming Star Nebula in there, Tadpole Nebula, Spider and Fly Nebula in one frame. Or fit the Andromeda Galaxy in there pretty handily. And because also it has a full frame imaging circle, you could get some extremely wide field of views if you use a full frame sensor with this telescope. So there you go, the field of view is well established, very wide. This is great because for me, for example, I love getting multiple DSOs in one frame. I think it just makes for a very interesting target. Or when you do have those extremely large ones like the Spaghetti Nebula, or the Andromeda Galaxy, being able to have the focal length to get them into one shot without having to do a mosaic speeds a lot up. Yeah, okay, you're gonna sacrifice fine detail, but I'd rather sacrifice fine detail in a mosaic and actually get a shot done. It is in use, however, where some of the issues with this telescope begins to show, but I'll get more onto that later. Actually, straight out of the box, the telescope has a really, really nice finish to it. It's all metal. It's got a very nice firm feel to it. And I particularly love this scaffold looking tube ring that it has. It has a top dovetail that you can use it as a handle or mounting something on and a finder guider on it. Also, the focuser as standard can rotate. It's got a lock on it and the focus mechanism is actually geared and not just a friction fit like a lot of other focuses. So the build quality is very, very nice. One thing I really don't like about the build quality though is this dew shield. As you can see, as you can see, it's retractable, right? So it goes in and out. This is really good for storage and taking up less space. However, that is not a very firm, tense fitting on it. Like, it wiggles a lot. There's not a lot of tension there. Uh, it doesn't really retract in us. <laughs> There's no real way of tightening the tension on this. So that is a bugbear I have with the retractable dew shield on the Sharp Star. <clears throat> I need some water. Another thing I'm actually fond of is the, the, the aesthetics, the color scheme of it. I love the red anodized. I love the gold. I love the black and all this. And especially when I put all my Zwo kit on it, it's just a sea of red and black and things like that. And it really carries a lot of favor with me. To say that you really like the aesthetics of stuff that is designed to be out in the dark, meh, it sounds a bit strange, but in all honesty, this mainly lives in the garage now and doesn't see a lot of clear skies lately. I was talking about how compact this is. When you actually put the dew shield in, this is 235 millimeters long. That is just a bit more than its reduced focal length. Also, it only weighs 1.9 kilograms. That's about 4.2 pounds. So it's very light. And even when you add a camera on the back of it, you're gonna be very hard pressed to find a star tracker or a mount that will not carry this. This actually, with a camera on it, could be a perfect match for something like a Sky Guider Pro or a Star Adventurer, things like that, star trackers like that. So, that also lends itself to its compact nature that it could just be put into a backpack with a star tracker and off you go to a nice dark site with a very wide instrument. Another downside, I'm going to say this is a downside, is that it comes with a ridiculously small, it comes with a ridiculously small 10 centimeter long dovetail. Now, if you're using it visually, this is gonna be absolutely fine, but especially on star trackers, you need to be balanced. And the fact is with the camera hanging off the back of it, even if you're just using a color camera and not filter wheels and stuff, you're not gonna get declination balance with it. So you're gonna need a longer dovetail. Now I would have put a longer dovetail on this, but because it's on loan from First Light Optics, I didn't, I just dealt with it 
the EQ6R Pro carries it just fine, even out of balance. So just factor these prices in when you're considering this telescope. So let's get on to the optics now. Being a telescope, the optics of it are kind of important. So the undisclosed triplet elements in this telescope, it's an APO triplet, which means it should have better color correction than doublet equivalents. The issue is they haven't disclosed what the glass is. Now looking at the price tag, I'm going to make an, an educated guess that it's FPL 51 and not the more exotic FPL 53. Now this isn't exactly a bad thing when you look at the ab diagram, 51 isn't that far behind 53. And also I really appreciate the text around the lens cell there. I'm not too sure why, but a bit of a lens snob like that, I think it looks nice. Just me? All right then. So as mentioned, it's a triplet, which means there's three lenses in it. And all these lenses are air spaced, as well as having full multi coatings on it. So this helps bringing the light to a very common focal point, which is one reason why the triplets have better color correction than doublets. A good triplet has better color correction than doublets. And the multi coatings helps the lens life and durability, also helps raise contrast and clarity of the optics. And to further help contrast, the inside of the tube has blackening in it, so it's not shiny inside of it, but there aren't any knife baffles, probably because of the size of the tube. So this would help raise contrast and remove the chance of reflections, but knife baffles would also further go for that. So maybe if they want to make a Mark III, they could think about trying to fit some baffles in there as well, perhaps. I found the images coming through the Sharp Star to be particularly pleasing. One of the ones I really like was my photo of the Pleiades that I took with the NGS-1 filter and the ASI 071 MC Pro with the optional reducer. This gave me an enormous field of view with just wonderful color correction and calibration. Now, there was a bit of extra blue in the picture, which I'm going to get onto in a little bit. Now, the reducer is sold separately and it is a 0.8 times reducer. Now, the observant amongst you might notice the somewhat bulbous front element, and that means that there's not really a place to put your filters. There are filters threads if you've got larger ones and they might not hit that element. But here's where a really interesting engineering solution comes in that I really appreciate. If you take the lens cell off of the body, you can see in there, there are M48 two inch threads in there to put your conventional filters in. And I just found that to be a really nice solution. You then just screw the lens cell back to the body and then attach this to your camera and telescope as you would normally. And now you're working with the filter. The reducer also has its own rotator on it. So there's actually two lots of rotation at that point but it's good to have it and not need it rather than to need it and not have it. And just to reiterate what I said earlier briefly, with the reducer, it comes down to 275 millimeters f4.5, which is extremely wide. If you start putting a full frame camera sensor on there or even an APS-C size camera frame on there, it's easily capable of swallowing things like M42 with room for more and just Eta Carina for the Southern images. At its native focal length, the Sharp Star will enjoy being teamed with cameras that are 3.2 micron pixels. And when you reduced it down to 275, it would really enjoy being teamed with cameras of 2.5 micron pixels. That means that the, for example, the ASI 183MC Pro is a perfect fit for this camera. You won't utilize the really wide field though because it has a smaller sensor in it. Almost everything else will be undersampled. Now don't let that dissuade you. Again, like I use the O71 MC Pro, which is 4.72 microns. It was undersampled, but my Pleiades photo is one of the favorites I've taken. And also then you could just drizzle your image and kind of get around that undersampling issue. I wanna get onto one major flaw that the reducer adds to the imaging train. A big fat fly and otherwise a juicy bowl of soup. I found, and other people report the same thing, slight blue chromatic aberration. Now, in my practice, I noticed that the blue channel with the monochrome camera was a bit harder to focus. The wavelength was a bit all over the place. When I used the OSC camera, you could see that there was a lot of blue bloat around several stars. Yes, the Pleiades is a very blue area, but it still looked a bit too much. And when they're focused with an autofocuser, the blue channel still is a bit more bloated than the others. Here's a comparison I made using the Zwo ASI 183MM Pro and Optolong LRGB filters. You can see the blue channel is noticeably more bloated than even the luminous channel, 
just a little, but looking closely, there it is. Now, these are all focused with the Batonov mask. And again, like I mentioned, when I was using the Batonov mask, the blue channel wavelengths was a lot more wavy when compared to red and green. So something is going on there. I'm going to show you a comparison now. This comparison was shot same night, same target, same camera, same filter, same integration time, 20 times three minutes, one hour each. The only difference was with and without the reducer. Let's have a look. Here it is without the reducer. And here it is with the reducer. Now I can just see that the blue channel, if we isolate the blue channel, it's slightly more bloated with the reducer. So, there's something going on in the blue channel. And also here you go, you kind of need a reducer flattener with this telescope. I mean, look at this field curvature. There is a fix that can be done in post-processing to help mitigate this effect. It's the same kind of thing we do, or at least I do, to reduce star sizes, where you go in, take the blue channel, and minimize the bloat around the stars that way. And it does help. However, you know, if it wasn't there, it would be better than trying to cure it. Prevention is always better than cure. So whilst the Sharpstar 61 EDPH2 is in its second iteration, they might want to go back and give the reducer a bit more thought. If Sharpstar can go back and rework this reducer and fix that blue channel issue, then I feel like the 61 EDPH2 could be an extremely good telescope for the price point, a very good triplet for the price point. The closest competitor I could find for aperture focal length and cost is actually the William Optics Zenith Star 61-2. And the Zenith Star is more expensive and is only a doublet. Now a good doublet can beat a bad triplet, but I don't feel like the Sharp Star is a bad trip, a bad triplet. They do come with an optical bench test and you know, the, the reducer lets it down. I don't think the optics are the weak point for this telescope. At the time of this review, the Sharpstar 61 EDPH2 comes in at budget friendly 438 pounds. Now I say wallet friendly because it's a triplet. It's not a doublet, it's triplet. Three elements with one ED glass in it. Budget is also an extremely individual thing. What's expensive for one person can be afforded for, for another person. I'm not saying it's cheap. The reducer is an additional £198, which in my opinion is quite steep when you consider that in my testing it needs a bit of a rework. The focuser is nice and smooth, this rack and pinion, I've got no faults with that at all. The tube body itself is nice and small, easy to transport, easy to put on equipment and mounts. The reducer I've spoken about at length and the dew shield is kind of limp like a slightly wet piece of spaghetti, but in my opinion the optics are very good and um, yeah i've had to use a bit of editing here and there to fix some blue channel bloat but otherwise i've really enjoyed my time with the sharp star because of that extremely wide field of view it's just hard to, to to articulate it until you've used a wide field telescope and you've got multiple targets in one frame or things like that it just adds a whole world of opportunity to your night sky arsenal I would be severely tempted to keep the Sharp Star because it complements my Evo Star 80ED very nicely. Because it's super, super wide, when you team it with the 80ED, it gives me a very wide array of focal lengths to operate at. And also, just as mentioned, the optics are nice and it's very fast for what it is with a full frame imaging circle. So how would I sum this up? I'd say it's a very nice triplet telescope that's having its full potential somewhat stymied by the reducer. So if that gets a rework and doesn't have a bit of blue channel bloat, then I'd have no difficulty at all recommending this telescope. Thanks very much for watching everybody. I hope you've enjoyed this review. Give it a thumbs up if you've enjoyed it. And if you think I could have done better, then you know what to do with that thumbs down button. And consider subscribing for more reviews such as this. So what do you think of the Sharp Star? Could you deal with the little issues it has? Would you be using it as a travel scope or to complement a lot a deeper telescope that you already own? Let me know in the comments down below. And with that, it's time to say thank you very much. I hope you have clear skies. Keep looking up, keep them cameras clicking. I'll see you later.